Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Road Show. My name is Karen Jensen Salisbury. I'm sitting in the host chair today. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here, too. And thanks for tuning into The Road Show. We have a great guest for you today on the program. We're welcoming back Dr. Mark Rutland. Dr. Rutland, it's good to hear your voice again. Welcome back. Thank you, and it's nice to be back with you. I always look forward to The Road Show. Yes, me too. And the last time you and I talked was way back in 2018 about your book, David the Great. And today we're talking about your latest book of Kings and Prophets, but you've written one in between, haven't you? Courage to be Healed? Yes, Courage to be Healed. Uh, the last two or three books have really, really taken off for us, Karen. Uh, David the Great was a an explosion it's uh, and still sells uh wonderfully uh courage to be healed was really a book about inner healing uh certainly we believe in physical healing and pray for it but this was about the healing of damaged emotions and uh, it's done very very well for us it's it's uh you know uh, a book that is it's sober it challenges and um and yet it's it's done well i was concerned about the sales on on uh, the healing of on inner healing book but they it's it's done really well it's called the courage to be healed um i believe with inner healing with emotional healing the greatest variable to getting healed is not faith i think it's courage yeah the, the yeah. courage to face the issues the courage to go through the process. I think the people with the greatest courage are the people who are most likely to find full healing from, you know, life can beat us up on the inside. Yeah. And takes courage to get healed. Yeah. And for sure, in the days that we're going through now, what a timely book. Thank you very much. I, I think it is. And uh, and I think this new one is um, is very much a, a book on time, and the, and the sales uh, really seem to tell us that. It's doing very well. So you are a book writing machine. How many books is this all together? How many have you written? Yep, this makes my 20th. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, <laughs> people always ask me, how many books have you written? I said, well, how many have I published or how many have I written? Because I got several <laughs> sitting in bottom drawers. <laughs> wow, we want to find out about those. And there's another one I have to ask you about. You wrote in 2016, and you it's called 21 Seconds to Change Your World. Excuse me, what an epic title. What is that one about? Well, it's a it's a book about the connection, the connecting tissue between the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's... Uh, it's a fascinating um, coincidence, if you will, a God incidence, that the two most popular, most frequently memorized devotional classics in two of the world's major religions were written by two men born in the same small village a thousand years apart. Wow. Uh, the 23rd Psalm, of course, written by David, and then uh, the Lord's Prayer by Jesus. And the title comes from... It takes about 21 seconds to pray the Lord's Prayer. And uh, and I found that using those two, learning how to use them, uh, for so many, particularly Protestants, you know, Catholics call it the Our Father, which makes sense since it begins Our Father. Right. Um, but for Protestants, so often they kind of uh, jettisoned the Lord's Prayer because it, it felt to them liturgical. And they were using it by rote. But I, what I wanted was to reinvigorate the use, the devotional use of the Lord's Prayer, and then um, cobble it together with the 23rd Psalm. And uh, and that was another big seller for us. The last four have really done well. That is great. Listeners, for those of you who haven't heard a lot about Dr. Rutland before, let me give you just a little bit of background. He's a New York Times bestselling author, as we've heard. He's pastored several churches. He's been the president of two universities, Southwestern University in Lakeland, Florida, and Oral Roberts University right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Dr. Rutland, my sons are ORU grads, so we thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I, just one slight little correction. It was Southeastern University. In I'm Lakeland. sorry. No, no problem at all. Uh, and Southwestern may not want the blame for me. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm glad. Were your sons there when I was there? Actually, my youngest had just finished. He actually went to work for the university as a recruiter uh, while you were there. 
Oh, great, great. See, I had the wisdom and the discernment to hire him. Yes, yes. And he he was so glad you came. (laughs) Oh, good. And so, again, uh, reading a a little bit about your history, you've been a missionary and evangelist, ordained minister, uh, founder of Global Servants, which is an organization that reaches people worldwide with crusades and seminars and camps and books and evangelism programs. Tell us a little bit about Global Servants. Yes, uh, my wife and I began Global Servants in 1977, um, and it evolved beyond anything we ever imagined. Really, I was looking for an instrument to do. I wanted to preach uh, in... I was a Methodist evangelist, and I wanted to find a way to support myself while I did uh, full gospel evangelism in the Methodist Church. And uh, that was really the only vision we had. I just didn't want to call it the Mark Rutland Evangelistic Association. It, every time I said it, I giggled, and I felt <laughs> nobody else would take it seriously either. So um, we called it Global Servants. Uh, and But its major um, outreach now is, is with our girls' homes. In 1986, uh, Allison and I planted our first girls' home in, in Chiang Rai, Thailand, in northern Thailand, uh, it's a world-class girls' home, uh, 14 buildings on two campuses. We have hundreds of girls that have been through. We have. Uh, it's been a tremendous, tremendous story. And now uh, we have a second one in Kumasi, Ghana. And our son has taken over Global Servants and is running it in a wonderful, wonderful way. And he has expanded the home in in Ghana. He has. Uh, he also has 70 churches there and uh, scattered around West Africa, mostly in Ghana. Wow. And uh, and a, a large K through eighth grade school has 500 students. And, uh, and then the House of Grace, both of those homes are called House of Grace in Thailand and Ghana. And uh, it's it's been one of the great honors of my life. We're, our tagline on those homes is saving little girls for big destinies. And we, Allison and I feel over the 54 years of marriage and ministry that we've been doing that the thing we feel the most gratification over is is house of grace and it it really has saved little girls for big destinies it's it's phenomenal we have attorneys uh, nurses teachers we have a, one missionary in china we have we have hundreds of graduates hundreds and they've really gone on to live meaningful and productive lives if someone listening wanted to find out more about Global Servants or get involved, what should they do? If they would go to our website, globalservants.org, that would be a great place. Uh, and they can click on House of Grace and find out how to support or help us with this work with little girls. Uh, and they can find out about all the other ministries. And if they're interested in the books and things like that, that probably would be a better place would be drmarkrutland.com. It probably doesn't matter to your listeners, Karen, but it matters to me to say it. I do not take one penny. I've never taken one penny from any of the 20 books. Even the royalty checks from our publishers go straight to the girls' homes. Uh, The books are strictly a way for me to uh, help support the girls' homes. So when people buy one of my books, they're also investing in House of Grace. Praise God. And another thing that you're really involved in is teaching on Christian leadership. Tell us about the NICL, what it stands for, and what it is. Thank you. Um, and they can check that out at thenicl.com. The, and they have to put in T-H-E, or it goes to some kind of a chemistry lab if you don't put in <laughs> T-H-E. So uh, the NICL is the National Institute of Christian Leadership. It has been a tremendous success. I've been teaching it for about uh, 18 years. We've had hundreds and hundreds of graduates, ministers mostly, staff, uh, but uh, we've had, um, I've had four college presidents go through it. I've had uh, physicians, attorneys, business people, uh, executives. Uh, it, it is a practical, hands-on course in leadership, management, uh, turnaround. The last session is on preaching and worship on communication. I had an Oklahoma state senator went through it some years ago, and I wow. I said to him, I said, Senator, I'm delighted for you to come through. The last one is on preaching. And he said, well, think of all the public speaking I do. And, and 
he he said it's been a tremendous help to him and in his business and in the in the political world too. So it's been great. People can find out about that at thenicl dot com. I was uh, nosing around on that website a little bit, and I, one of the things that you asked on there was struck me. This said, you know, do you feel stuck? Are you a leader? And do you feel stuck? Maybe a pastor in your church isn't growing or you don't feel like you're getting anywhere. Talk about that for just a minute. Yeah, one of the, in fact, the the New York Times bestseller that I wrote was called Relaunch. And uh, that one was a more of a business and leadership book, and it exploded. That was the number one New York Times bestseller that I wrote. And in it, what I dealt with is companies, organizations, churches, universities, whatever, that that just kind of run aground. They get stuck on a reef. And what do you do? What what practical things does one do to nudge it off of the reef without ripping the hole out and yet at the same time get on with the journey? Where How do you – so relaunch doesn't just mean a turnaround. It can mean speeding up. It can mean changing directions. But there can just come a time in an organization or in a leader's life even where where you just need to to change direction, then you're just not sure what to do. And the NICL, that's one of the things we specialize in is is making the turn. Yeah, I just feel like there's somebody out there listening today who might need to hear that. Again, the website, if you're interested in that, is the NICL.com, T H E. N-I-C-L dot com. Listeners, we're talking with Dr. Mark Rutland today, and so far we're just in the introduction. We're going to take a little break here, and when we come back, we're going to dive into his latest book of Kings and Prophets, Understanding Your Role in Natural Authority and Spiritual Power. You don't want to miss it. Stay tuned. I'm David Warren here with some exciting news for Oasis listeners. We have a new mobile device app. It's free, easy to download, and lets you enjoy our refreshing music and talk everywhere you go. If you have an Android cell phone, go to the Google Play Store. And if you have an iPhone or iPad, visit the Apple Store and search for Oasis Radio Network. Be an Oasis ambassador and share this news with family and friends around the world. Oasis It's a great day on the road show. I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury, your host for today, and we are honored to be talking with Dr. Mark Rutland about his latest book of Kings and Prophets, Understanding Your Role in Natural Authority and Spiritual Power. Dr. Rutland, first off, why did you write this book? What inspired you? Well, in a, in a sense, it was a, a natural follow-up to the book on David. David the Great was a, a huge hit for us and still sells very well. So I had been dealing with interaction between, say, Nathan and David uh, and Samuel and David, Samuel and Saul. So I, it was in my mind to a certain extent. Beyond that, uh, we've entered into a season in American life particularly, I suppose, worldwide life, but American life particularly, where the conflict or the, maybe conflict is the wrong word, the friction between the the supernatural authority uh, of of God and the kingdom rubbing up against secular power is a constant, a ubiquitous issue in cultural life, particularly in America. And so I wanted to write a book that took that issue and took it out. I didn't want to write a book where I was calling names politically or anything. I wanted to write a book that would relate to that. So I used the conflict between the Old Testament kings and the prophets who confronted them so that the I felt the issue would carry over, and and it certainly seems to have in people's minds. Yeah, and I really like the subtitle, Understanding My Role. Like your average person reading this who isn't a president or a prophet or a king, you know, understanding our role in supernatural authority and spiritual power. What do you want your average everyday reader to take away from this? Well, I I would say three things. First of all is there has never been a season of church. Now, instead of looking at the secular side, let's look at church life. There's never been a season where we need more discernment. 
than there is right now. Yes. There, there are, I use kings uh, to mean, but it means representatives of secular power. That can mean uh, the phenomenally wealthy or celebrities or the military leaders or politicians. There are fake kings. There are fake kings. Uh, Herod, by the way, was a fake king. Um, He was also not even a Jew. He was appointed as the king of Israel by Caesar. So he was a puppet king controlled by Caesar, and he wasn't even Jewish. He was Idumean. So there are fake kings, and there are false prophets. But I will say this. Actually, false prophets are more dangerous than fake kings. Hmm. And uh, and if we're going to live in this world that we live in, we need wisdom and discernment and judgment for to be able to analyze the kings and the prophets. Yeah, you know, uh, Dr. Charles Stanley wrote the intro to your book, and I like what he said. He says, one area that appears to be particularly confusing these days is that of leadership and how we can relate to those in power. I'm grateful that my friend Dr. Mark Rutland has taken the time to delve into the Old Testament and find answers to many of the questions believers are asking today. So this really is applicable to where we are in history. That's what I wanted to write. And uh, I was very grateful for Dr. Stanley. It is interesting, uh, isn't it? Here's a book about prophecy uh, written by somebody who is unapologetically spirit-filled, and the the foreword is written by one of the world's most famous Southern Baptists. Yeah, and that's a that's an interesting combination, isn't it? And it is. Doctor Stanley has been a friend. Uh, he spoke for me when I was at ORU and did a brilliant job. I've preached for him at First Baptist in Atlanta when he was still the pastor there. So we've been uh, colleagues and friends at a certain level. When I sent the manuscript to him and asked him would he consider it, he said, I won't consider it till I read the manuscript. And he read it, and he said, I'd be proud to write this forward. Yeah, I could tell that from reading his intro that he really had read it, which is not always the case. <laughs> it's true. It is true. But uh, he was very gracious, and I thought the forward was good. And um, and it's uh, he's right that it is about helping people. And throughout the book, I used a device, a literary device I invented and used for David the Great, and it was these little outtakes called Lessons from Old Dr. Mark. Yes, I love those. And uh, so I used those in David, and the editor and I discussed it back and forth, uh, and I was afraid it had been overused, and she felt very strongly I should use it again in this book. So what I tried to do is do the narrative, explain the situation, and then do an outtake This is okay, what does this mean to you? Right. What's What's the lesson from old Dr. Mark for you personally to make it applicable uh, to the person's life? Yeah, and you say right off the bat in chapter one, you didn't write this to be a biographical sketch, like you said, of prophets or even zero in on their messages, but you wanted to know what, what happened when a prophet arrived at the intersection of history at the same time as a king, and they spoke truth to power. Talk a little bit about speaking truth to power then and now. Yeah. If there's ever been a phrase that is trite and overused yeah. in the modern culture, it's speaking truth to power. It's come to mean everything, and therefore it's come to mean nothing. Um, a, a junior high school boy stands up and cusses out his teacher in an English class, and he thumps his chest that he spoke truth to power, when actually he's just a, a rebellious little brat. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, then uh, some uh, nitwit movie star makes some cockamamie political speech at the Academy Awards, and she claims that she's speaking truth to power, but there's no risk to her. She knows the audience agrees with her. The only risk she runs is that she gets a standing ovation. Yeah. But she says she's speaking truth to power. You want to understand truth to power, look at the prophets. John the Baptist, for example, uh, he, he denounced Herod's uh, illegal and incestuous marriage to his own sister-in-law. And uh, and as a result of it, uh, Herod, um, and with a conspiracy from Herodias, his illegal wife, and Salome, her daughter, uh, took John's head off. So you, you speak truth to power. That's a real thing. That's not just some goofy contemporary uh, political idea. The kings were 
unquestioned power. They weren't the presidents of republics with Supreme Courts that, that could check them or Congresses. The law was embodied in them. If they said, kill this prophet, they, they were killed. Right. So that's speaking truth to power is a different thing. Secondly, you have to deal with the issue of truth. Saying your opinion to power is not speaking truth to power. When, when, and that deals with the second issue. I told you the first one was discernment. The second one is false prophets who say, thus saith the Lord. It's fine to talk about a political prognostication or something you want to happen or that you think will happen or whatever. But once you tack on, thus saith the Lord, now that's a different thing. That takes it to a different altitude and velocity, and you have to be held accountable for that. Yeah, there's always such a risk involved. I, I, whenever I think of Old Testament prophets, I think, I'm glad I don't have their job and how brave they were. Yes, yes, they had to be brave on both sides. They had to be brave in the face of a king, and they had to be bold to say what they felt God had said to them, and they had to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a false prophet in uh, the Old Testament. A lot of people may not know of him. His name is Zedekiah, um, not to be confused with the king Zedekiah. Um, Zedekiah made a false prophecy to Ahab, a wicked king, and he told Ahab he was going to win. And then a true prophet, Micaiah, corrected him and said to Ahab, not only are you not going to win this battle, you're going to be killed on the battlefield. And uh, Ahab, this wicked king, says, when I come back from the battle, I'm going to throw you in prison. And Micaiah, this true prophet, he says, if you come back at all, I'm a false prophet. So true prophets want to be held accountable for the validity of their word. False prophets prophesy what they want to happen or what people in positions of power want to hear. Yeah. Yeah, and in using John the Baptist as an example, that led to two other questions that you ask is, were there other New Testament prophets, and are there still prophets today? And that is one of the biggies. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for asking the most controversial question you could ask. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, okay. There are other uh, New Testament prophets or people that m minister. Philip uh, had daughters who it says uh, prophesied. So they did, pro they weren't called prophets in that sense, but it says they did prophesy. So one must assume women who prophesy are prophets. There was another uh, New Testament prophet named Agabus. And Agabus made two very significant and important prophecies, both of which came true. He was a true prophet, and he is listed as a prophet. Now, what about today? I used to tell the young people at the universities, just because somebody puts profit on their business card doesn't mean they are one. <laughs> right. And so what I say is there are people with prophetic ministries, lowercase p, and then there are prophets, uppercase p. So um, use, let's use the word apostle and apostolic. My, my late friend, I was very close friends with Reinhard Bunke. And uh, I feel he had an apostolic ministry to Africa. But I do not list him as an apostle in the sense that James and John were apostles. That's a different thing. But he had an apostolic ministry. All right, I think there are people today who have a prophetic ministry. Uh, Leonard, uh, he, God rest his soul, Leonard Ravenhill had a prophetic ministry. But I would say it's a bridge too far to list him as a prophet in the sense that Jeremiah was. So therefore, I'm always reluctant to pin the, the name tag on prophet. What I do say is there are people who speak prophetically. Yeah, yeah, that's a good explanation. And so you're talking about here in chapter one, we're going to look at these intersections between the prophets and the kings that don't want to hear what they're saying. <laughs> and you kind of ask the question, who were the prophets? What is the, you know, the, the striking mark of recognizing a prophet in the Old Testament? Yeah, the first thing is they were human beings. So uh, uh, this is a very important point. The prophets 
did not claim to be and were not entirely perfect. Um, some of them struggled with depression. Elijah struggled with depression. Yeah. Um, sometimes fear. Moses Moses was a a, a dark melancholy, um, and it made a very disastrous false start in his prophetic ministry. Trying to his prophetic ministry call on his life was to free the the Hebrew slaves, and right. so his first effort was a little <laughs> unsuccessful. Right. He killed a guy. You know, so the first thing is they were human beings. But the second thing is they were human beings who in their lives and in their inner selves were able to come to that divine encounter where they heard from God. They carried a word from God. These modern worship services where somebody stands up and, you know, they say, you know, thus saith the Lord. That is not at the same level and at all to be understood and heard in the sense that Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, they were in the secret place with God and they heard from God. So they're real human beings who hear a real word from a real God for a real time in history. Yeah. And we're having those real times of history now, too. Yes, yes, <laughs> huge. Yes. Listeners, we're talking today with Dr. Mark Rutland about his new book of Kings and Prophets, Understanding Your Role in Natural Authority and Spiritual Power. Dr. Rutland, tell us how we can get the book. Of course, you can get the book anywhere you buy books, but the easiest and fastest way to get it is drmarkrutland.com. We can get the book out to you today. And what else will we find on your website when we go there? There you can find any information about me and the ministry that I pursue. You can also find, go to websites, Global Servants, and understand our ministry to our girls' homes and other things that we do. And com will help you find out about um, the Leadership Institute, the National Institute of Christian Leadership that I teach. I guess I have more websites than brains. I don't know how this happened. <laughs> probably not. Probably organically, not on purpose. Can, I think so. I can think we so. find all your other books there, too, on your website? Yes. Yes, at drmarkrutland.com, you can find every kind of resource that I have or have ever produced, and I would love for people to have it all. Great. We're going to take a little break right now. When we come back, we're going to talk about how there are some kings you ignore and some kings you have to fight. Stay with us. The Roadshow is a listener favorite, which airs each weekday here on the Oasis Radio Network, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Central. The Roadshow also has a great section on our website, oasisnetwork.org. There you'll find audio archives of select past interviews, plus guest lineup and contact information, and links to our Roadshow sponsors and its host. So join us for The Roadshow, whether on your radio, computer, or mobile device at oasisnetwork.org. Welcome back. I hope you're enjoying the road show today as much as I am. I'm your host, Karen Jensen Salisbury. We are talking with Dr. Mark Rutland about his latest book of Kings and Prophets, Understanding Your Role in Natural Authority and Spiritual Power. What a an apropos book for these days. Dr. Rutland, tell us how you chose which prophets to talk about in this book. Actually, that's an interesting question. I've been interviewed on this book a hundred times, and nobody's ever asked me that. That was actually one of the most difficult parts of the process. Sure. Uh, because there are so many at various levels, uh, and you have prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the more uh, the writing prophets, if you will. You have the minor prophets, Malachi, et cetera. Um, what I, what I wanted was, first of all, prophets that had some kind of uh, intersectional relationship with a king or a person of power. I put kings in quotation marks, okay? A general, a king, a person of secular power. So I wanted that, first of all, that they had some point of friction um, that they came up against the king. The second was I was looking for some means – uh, of applying that to our contemporary lives. How does that intersection, what does that teach me about my life, what I'm dealing with? So those were the two major issues uh, that that I wanted. There was a, there's a list of prophets, many, uh, and I 
I wanted to find prophets that perhaps people weren't as familiar with as others. Uh, when you say name the prophets, people are going to start with the, the big writing prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Sure. And I, I wanted to sort of deal with some. Uh, there are a lot of people who have read the Bible and could not tell you who Micaiah was. Uh, there are people who have read the Bible and don't understand that there were more than one prophet that intersected with David and uh, and and that they played different roles entirely in his life. Right. So I, I, those were some of the issues I wanted to deal with. And so you start out in chapter 2 with Abraham, which some people who you make reference to don't even think of him as a prophet. Yes, um, because we are contemporary believers and not... Uh, Jews, we don't always think of Abraham, but Abraham is listed, and uh, certainly in the Jewish understanding of prophets, as the principal prophet. The two greatest prophets in Judaism are Abraham and Moses. And Abraham, because he is basically the father of Judaism, and Moses, because he is the lawgiver. And uh, so a lot of people might list a dozen prophets before they ever listed either of them. Abraham uh, was may surprise people because you say, well, what does Abraham have to do with kings? Actually, Abraham in his prophetic role may have encountered more kings than any of the other prophets. <laughs> at one time, he is encountering 10 at one time. Uh, so uh, Abraham uh, deals with the king of Egypt, the king of Syria. He deals with different kings. He deals with the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. He de- he has a, a war with the ten kings, Amraphel and, and his uh, allies. So Abraham is one of those prophets that doesn't always speak a prophetic word, but he has to act prophetically. And then the greatest of all his encounters with kings is with the king of Salem, right. Mel- Melchizedek. So Abraham really is exhibit one uh, uh, in terms of kings and prophets. And so that phrase that I mentioned at the end of last uh, segment about there are some kings you ignore and some you have to fight, you refer to that when we're talking about Abraham. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important lesson for people. Maybe out of this whole uh, radio broadcast today, if, if they would only hear this, there are some kings... You, you, don't have, you don't have to fight every king you encounter. And remember, king, Karen, I'm talking about sources of secular power. Yeah. So you don't, you don't, one doesn't have to fight every king you encounter. Some kings you just walk away from, you just ignore. Uh, so take, for example, the king of Sodom. When, when Abraham, Abram, rescues his nephew Lot uh, from the, 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 confederation of kings that conquer Sodom and Gomorrah before Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed by God. They're, they are conquered by uh, a confederation of, of foreign kings. And Lot and his family and everybody else from Sodom and Gomorrah and all the loot and everything else is taken. Abraham takes his men and they go and defeat these kings and rescue everybody, including his own family, Lot. And the king of Sodom offers him Basically, he says, look, all the loot, all, everything that the, that the kings have conquered, you can have it all. And Abram makes a very important statement. He says, I don't want a shoelace from you. I don't want it to be said that the king of Sodom made me rich. Right. And he basically walks away. He ignores it. So there are some sources of secular power that you need to ignore, walk away from, and don't get entangled with. There are other kings where you have to fight. And those were the kings that conquered um, Sodom and Gomorrah and and captured Lot and his family and all the people. So there are struggles that are worth embracing. So I guess I'd put it this way. Not every hill is worth dying on. Right. Sometimes you don't need to get bogged down in the fight. Just walk away. That's so good. And bringing that into current day times and me as a reader of your book, without mentioning specifics, how do we know which ones to ignore and which ones to fight? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's uh, yes, that's the $64,000 question, isn't it? 
Now, that's the reason earlier in the broadcast I said if there is one thing that contemporary believers need to pray for, it's discernment. Yeah. To be able to hear. But I would say that a good test is try to keep your own ego out of it. Um, the issue of whether or not you're going to get in the struggle, if you're going to wade into the fray, is not how it makes you feel. That's good. Uh, so, so don't let your emotions guide you into a conflict that you don't need to be involved in. Um, have you heard from God? Is the Lord telling you to be involved? Say only what he tells you to say. No, don't add anything. Don't tidy it up. And and sometimes there there has to be a struggle. I, we are facing issues uh, culturally and politically. I understand parents that stand up at at school board meetings. There there there's struggles that have to be waded into, and right. I understand that. But if the king, quote unquote, if the king is your brother-in-law and you're arguing oh, oh, over. Uh, a bicycle that he borrowed from you 20 years ago. Is this, <laughs> is this really, is this really a supernatural conflict on that? When I say walk away. Yeah. Well, for me, it just sounds like good news to know you don't have to fight everyone. I mean mm. that we can get so overwhelmed in today's yes. era with all the things that are going wrong maybe. And we feel like, should I be doing more, you know, but maybe we don't have to just seek the Lord is what you're saying. Yes, and make sure you really have heard from God. Is Do I need to be in this fight? Do I need to be in this fight now? Right. And if I'm in it, what are you telling me to do? Right. Well, and you mentioned already these wonderful uh, things at the end of each chapter, lessons from old Dr. Mark, which always makes me laugh. You know, we're not old, <laughs> Dr. Mark. We're young. <laughs> you are young. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I, I, I'm looking at the one here about Abraham, um, what we are supposed to learn from Abraham, one of the things you say is enjoy victory after the victory. Mm. Very important. After every conflict that you're in, I wish every listener would listen to me, particularly pastors. After every conflict that you're in, even if you win, you're tireder than you think. You, you're more used up. Every conflict uses you up. Yeah. And, and in that moment, your decision maker may be wounded or broken. Don't make subsequent decisions too quick after a con. You take a, torp a torpedo to midships, you don't need to be making complex emotional decisions when you're still trying to repair the damage. Live over it, get over it, find God's healing grace, spend time with God. It's, it's very, very important. Immediately after his basically a, a war, a battle with 10 kings, Abraham's first important encounter is with the, the king of Salem, Melchizedek, the prince of peace, the king of peace, Salem, Shalom. Uh, and he... Uh, he goes and has communion with the king of peace, Melchizedek. Above all things I could say, after a big conflict, even if you win, you're more drained than you think you are. Get alone with God and get restored. That is just some wisdom for life. Another thing that you list there, uh, live and lead without fear. Yes, I, I think that one of the when I in the NICL I talk about it too. I said if you can identify the thing you're most afraid of and confront that. For example, uh, a pastor who says the thing I'm the most afraid of is being kicked out of this church, being fired or dismissed or whatever. If you can deal with that, if you can find God's resource to deal with that with that uh, greatest fear. A level of boldness and confidence can come into your life and your ministry. Once you say, this church is not my source, this board is not my source, mm, yeah. this, this salary is not my source. Once you come to that and you really embrace that reality, the boldness of the line of the tribe of Judah is yours. It doesn't make you arrogant or presumptuous. You're not trying to tick people off. It is that it gives you a level of fearlessness. I can say what God tells me to say because God is my source. That fear is swallowed up in victory. Good. And then one more from Abraham. Be careful where you pitch your tent. 
I think I've got you figured out. You like that funny story. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I was a counselor at a camp when I was in college. I was uh, taking every job. I was working my way through college. My family were poor, and I, I didn't have a resource. So I was taking every job I could get that was legal. Uh, and uh, I was a counselor at a camp. On um, One night a week, we had to take these kids and go camp in the woods. So I had a bunch of fifth grade boys and I'd set them up in their little tents or tent and I was in mine, but we got to the place after dark. And so we didn't really have a good sense of what was going on. We set the tents up and then we built a campfire and made s'mores and all the stuff you're seeing, all the traditional stuff. Right. And I was 19 and thought that it was my job to tell them scary stories. And I scared the absolute wits out of these kids. <laughs> And then we all, they got in their tents, I got in mine. About one o'clock in the morning, Karen, there came the most horrendous sound you have ever, I mean, it was like the sound of a banshee attacking. It was horrible. And those little boys came from all over the campsite, screaming and crying and running to me. So I took my torch, my, what do you call flashlight? I took my flashlight and went out and my tent our campsite, had we had put it next to a fence, but in the dark, I hadn't looked on the other side of the fence was a huge army mule, not a little cute little donkey, one of these great big army mules. And people that have never heard a mule bray, they don't know what a horrible sound it is, especially in the middle of the night when yeah. you don't know what it is. And I learned my lesson, and that is... Be careful where you pitch your tent. There may be some jackass on the other side of the fence you don't want to be close to. <laughs> and, and Abraham in the, Sodom, right? That's yes, how the, that's where Lot pitched his tent near Sodom. Yeah. And Abraham didn't. Abraham was careful where he pitched his tent. So, uh, Lot wasn't. Lot was compromised by Sodom long before he was conquered by Sodom. Yeah. Very good. Listeners, if you've just tuned in, we're talking with Dr. Mark Rutland about his latest book of Kings and Prophets, Understanding Your Role in Natural Authority and Spiritual Power. You can find out more about the book or all of his books and about Dr. Rutland's ministry at drmarkrutland.com. When we come back, let's find out more lessons from old Dr. Mark that we can apply to our lives in everyday life. We'll be back after this. I'm David Warren, Program Director at Oasis Radio Network and one of the hosts of this podcast. All of our hosts enjoy hearing from you, our listening family, so drop us a note. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and you'll receive new episodes on your mobile devices. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to The Roadshow. My name is Karen Jensen Salisbury, and we have been so blessed to have you join us for The Roadshow today. We've been talking with Dr. Mark Rutland about his newest book of Kings and Prophets, Understanding Your Role in Natural Authority and Spiritual Power. In the last segment, we talked about Abraham in chapter 2, and Dr. Rutland, you go on to cover Moses and Samuel and Nathan and Elijah and Elisha, plus four kings and six prophets and a god on the move. Yow, there's a lot. <laughs> and it's all so rich, but of course we can't cover them all in, you know, just this road show. So Dr. Rutland, is there anything in particular you want to hit among those as we go zooming by them? I tell you what, let's turn it the other way. Instead of thinking just about prophets and how they reacted to kings, let's think about how kings reacted to prophets. Ah. Uh, the The risk of rejecting the word of truth when it comes to you. Uh. Um, so when I was uh, 25, 100 years ago, <laughs> uh, I, I went to pastor my very first church. There was an old man in the church then who had been a little boy uh, in a holiness church. His father, who, so this old man was the little boy, his father owned the only Model A in the church. And they got a new preacher, and the preacher wanted to go up and try to win a local moonshiner to Christ. So his father agreed to drive the preacher up there, and the little boy rode in the back seat. They got there. The moonshiner was very resistant and angry. And finally, he took his fist, the, the, the 
butt of his fist and he just popped the the this preacher between his eyes on his forehead just popped him like that Ow. and staggered him backward and the the little boy said from the back seat of the, his father's model a he saw that preacher raise his arms and say thus saith the lord as you have tapped the man of god i will tap you so he said that's all it was some weeks later he was out with his father again in the car and there was a car wreck and his father got out to go look at it, and he came back to the car and got the little boy and said, come with me. I want you to see this, and I don't ever want you to forget it. It took him down the hill to this car wreck, and it was the truck uh, of that moonshiner delivering moonshine, and he had driven off the road and crashed it. And the steering column had been driven through his forehead, Oof. and he was killed. And And that story stuck with me that there is – huge risk in hearing a con confrontational word from God and and blowing it off or resisting it. And yeah. the kings who did that, Saul is the classic case. He rejected what Samuel had to say. He lived in rebellion and compromise, and, and he ended his life. The king, the God-chosen, God-ordained king, and he ended his life in witchcraft and madness and suicide. There's a risk in rejecting the Word of God. Yeah. Cautionary tales. Yes. Cautionary. And cautionary tales are supposed to make us have caution. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. We can learn from them for sure. Well, let's look at the end of some of these chapters, the lessons from old Dr. Mark. Uh, let's look at the one about Moses. And you say, never claim for yourself what belongs to God. Yeah. Now, that's one of the most important things in the whole book for contemporary society. What was the conflict between Moses and Pharaoh? Many people think it was about slavery. It wasn't precisely because there may very well have been other slaves of other races. It was about who owned the Hebrew people. Pharaoh said, I do. And God said, no, I do. So that was the conflict it was yeah. actually about ownership. If you remember... Pharaoh had claimed for himself the power of life and death. Remember that he told the Egyptian midwives when a Hebrew male baby is born, kill it. So that's because he said, I own it. Now, Karen, think about this. The contemporary mantra of the pro-abortion crowd is my body, my choice. So yes, the murder of an unborn baby is the consequential sin of, of abortion. And, and I'm, I'm not making light of it. It's a horrible sin. Murder is a horrible sin. But it's not the primary sin. The primary sin is self-ownership. So you say, I, it's my body. God says, no, it's mine. Yeah. You say, it's, it's my unborn baby. God says, no, it's mine. So before a woman can commit an, an abortion, a murder, she has to first deny the ownership of God. So the real issue in abortion is it's not your body. It's not your choice. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then there's one here, lessons from old Dr. Mark about Samuel. Uh, partial obedience is disobedience. Yes. Saul again. This guy. Okay, so God tells Saul when he wipes out this, uh, this Amalekites to... Um, destroy the livestock, everybody, everything, wipe it out. It's God's instrument of judgment on these people. So Samuel arrives and he says to Saul, did you kill all the livestock? He says, absolutely, we killed them all. I mean, <laughs> it, the story is almost, it's like a Monty Python sketch. <laughs> so he says, yes, I killed them all. And, he, and Samuel says, okay, I can hear all, all the bleeding of these sheep. And he says, okay, well, we didn't kill them. Yeah, we were yeah. going to use them for sacrifice. And Samuel says, do you think God prefers sacrifice or obedience? Then he says, did you kill all the Amalekites? And Saul says, now that I did. I 100% we killed all the Amalekites. And Samuel says, well, who's in your tent? <laughs> and he says, okay, well, the king. So he kept the king of all the Amalekites yeah. alive in his tent. So partial obedience is disobedience. Yeah, uh, you, you you can't kind of obey God and call it obedience. 
He expects to be obeyed. He expects to be obeyed now, and he expects to be obeyed without reservation. And wouldn't you say it's always for our benefit? Oh, it's always for our benefit. Every prophetic word that we ever hear, every every true authoritative, thus saith the Lord, will always be for our benefit. Now, <laughs> Jamie Buckingham, my late friend, used to always say, the truth will set you free, but first it'll make you miserable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes, I, I, I'm not saying that every word from God will make you immediately giddy and happy. It is for your benefit. Yeah. And here's a lesson from old Dr. Mark about Nathan, uh, who was prophesying to David, beware of the seduction of power. Yes. When God positions one, if God positions you, gives you access to power, maybe you become the best friend of some famous athlete or you're next in relationship somehow to a a billionaire or you you have some politician God gives you access to. That's a great gift and you should receive it and you need to be there and be sure that you speak truth to power as we began this broadcast. But you have to remember that being in those corridors of power, being with that kind of wealth and celebrity can be very, very seductive. There's a fascinating little verse in Proverbs. Uh, it says, when you sit at the table of a rich man, put a knife to your own throat. Mm. It, it means you have to say to yourself, I don't have to have these dainties. I don't have to have this rich food. I don't need this rich friend. I don't need this politician. There were m many, many preachers who get close to politicians and think it lends something to their lives. They are there for the politician, not vice versa. And it's very, very seductive, dangerous territory. You have to keep that knife to your throat. Yeah. I wish we had time to talk about all the content of this book, but of course we don't. Listeners, again, we've been talking with Dr. Mark Rutland about his latest book of Kings and Prophets, Understanding Your Role in Natural Authority and Spiritual Power. You can find out more about it and more about Dr. Mark at drmarkrutland.com. Dr. Mark, before we leave today, will you pray for our listeners? Yes. Let's do that. Heavenly Father, we all petition you for ourselves and for each other. Give us wisdom and discernment. Oh, Lord, we live in these troubled times, and they can trouble us. Give us calmness and peace in your presence and the sense of your presence in every day, no matter what we face and no matter what we see on the television. And when you position us in places of access, give us wisdom and discernment and boldness, but above all things, May our love level be high enough to say the things that you call us to say. In Jesus' wonderful name, the strong Son of God, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Rutland, and thanks for being on the Roadshow again. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I always look forward to it. Listeners, thanks for being with us today. On behalf of the Oasis Network, this is Karen Jensen Salisbury and my wonderful special guest, Dr. Mark Rutland, saying thanks for listening today. It's been another great roadshow. You've been listening to The Roadshow. If you'd like to write to us, here's our address. The Roadshow, P.O. Box 1924, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74101. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. The views of today's guest aren't necessarily those of this station, but we do appreciate and thank our guest for spending this time with us. The Roadshow, an Oasis Network presentation.